Uh, well, to kick things off, I would like to say thank you very much for the invite. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks everyone for making the time and uh, joining us for the Open Science MOOC first ever webinar. I'm really uh, pleased to be here. And for those of you who want the slides, they're already available, as you can see already in this link, uh, as a PDF, so you can use them as you want. And if you want, and later we can put the, the raw copies or so the uh, LibreOffice file so that you can also use the slides for yourselves, okay? Um, sorry, just a second. Um, here. So basically, we're going to talk a little bit about how can we bring uh, science to the 21st century, and we're going to show a little bit how I think we are still stuck uh, a couple of centuries before, but basically how to use open source tools for better research. Um, my name is John Seres Andre Maia Chagas, and I would like to start a little bit of who, who am I, what am I doing here, and uh, you know why, why you should care about listening to the things I'm saying. So I've been advocating for open science for a, for a number of years now, and it all started when I put up a website called Open Neuroscience in the Air, which just puts um, projects together um, for um, for open science and um, for neuroscience specifically. So I was just collecting tools from other people um, and putting everything online so that other people could use it. Then I got started working with, a, with an NGO called Trend in Africa, where we've been teaching researchers, in the, or not teaching, but ex exchanging with researchers in the continent on how to use open source tools to improve their research. Um, and one of the things we've been doing is actually showing people how can they use open source hardware to build their own tools in Africa, which has been um, getting quite a bit of traction, so it's a quite nice project. I'm also working with PLUS, with a couple of other people editing in an open source toolkit. So there are a lot of open source software and hardware there. Most recently, I've worked with Mozilla and the uh, Freies Wissen Fellowship, where we've been mapping scientific equipment demand to basically know what kind of tools researchers need uh, in their labs and basically try to build these tools in open source ways. I'm also building tools myself uh, at the Baden Lab in Sussex. Um, and most recently, I actually started a company uh, with Karen in Germany, where we're trying to provide open source hardware as a service for scientists and educators. So full disclosure here, um, we are, so you could see of this as me trying to pitch a little bit of from my company, but all the way around, you could also see that this is from somebody who believes so much in open source tools for science that he decided to dedicate his life to providing these tools or bringing these tools to scientists around the world, right? Um, okay, so that's enough about me. I think we can uh, move on to the summary. What are we going to see today? So basically, um, I want to very, very briefly talk about science funding and then talk a little bit about software and how, why we should be using open source software and not uh, pre-made packages like Excel and, and Windows and MATLAB and so on. Um, then a very, very short introduction to open source. I bet most people already know what it is, but just so that we lay the ground for those who do not know, and then we talk about open science software. We have a little bit of time for questions. Then uh, we talk about scientific equipment and why is it a time for an overhaul in the way we produce and use scientific equipment. Then we talk about open source, open science hardware, communities and interesting links. And then we open for questions again, okay? So I hope this is a good mixture in between me speaking and people being able to interact and ask questions, all right? So a little bit of how, how we're funded, right? Everybody knows this, but I think it's always good to remind people. So we have taxpayers' money that become grants, and then with a lot of effort in a lab, you write a grant, you get this approved, and then you get money to do your research, right? This goes funneled into three main things, which are the tools that we use, human resources, and literature access, right? With a lot of hard work, a little bit of luck, uh, this becomes then publications, drugs, new treatments, new tech, right? The problem starts here, I think, the way basically uh, these things leave uh, the universities into the, let's say, um, into the world. Right? I wanted to say real world, but the universities are also the real world. Anyways, um, <laughs> so these things are then, unfortunately, because of the systems we're using, they are either patent or copyright because universities are not equipped to make mass productions of the things that they are doing, nor they're interested in this, right? This is not the role in society. So basically, the university is going to patent something that was created in the university. There's going to be a technology transfer to a few companies or just one company that then is going to have solely the rights for something that was funded with public money. 
And then, of course, in a market logic, if they're the only ones uh, providing these tools or this technology or whatever it is, then they can charge basically whatever they want. Right? This leads to high costs and makes something that was public be private in the hands of a company. So this is bad on itself, um, and this is where I think open source should come to change this. So, right, we're going to see a little bit what open source is and, and how we, it's going to work for things, in comp or for, for things we produce in academia. But basically, I want to start by showing how we are losing by not using open source, in this case software, uh, in research. And this is a paper that came out in 2016 showing that by using uh, proprietary software, or even in this case, even open source software, uh, that are not made for research. So basically, people use um, Excel spreadsheets to record their gene names right, and do data analysis. And this paper shows that basically, the softwares that are not made for gene names, they actually change the name of the gene into some number. And then when this is converted back to the gene name, when you reopen the file or whatever, uh, this gets corrupted in a way, and then the name gets changed. Right, so what you can see on the, on the inbox on the right side is that f um, you can see the percentage of name errors in papers in genomics in the supplementary files in between 2005 and 2015 according to um, the journal. Right, so neuro, uh, Nature had the most with 30%. Uh, there is an overall average of almost 20%. And this is terrible, right? Because if you're a PhD student and you're doing your research on a specific gene and you think you're studying the right gene because you read on the paper the name, it might be that you're actually studying something completely wrong and you're dedicating years of your life to study something that ends up being the wrong gene. Right? You might find exciting things, but you also might then be talking about something that is not even that specific gene. So this is, of course, a big problem. Right? Um, so this is one argument why we should be using tailored software for the things we need to do inside research. Right, so this is just a little bit of an explanation from the text, which I already explained. Uh, we don't need to go over this again. Um, another problem that we have is that people don't release their code even when they're creating the software themselves, right? So basically, what you see here is a retraction from a paper where the, where the researchers um, understood or found out after the, the paper was published that there was a problem with their analysis and uh, once they corrected the analysis, the whole paper became um, useless because the results are all bogus, right? So basically, these, these researchers were honest enough to say, look, they retracted the paper, as we, everybody would expect, but we don't know if everybody <laughs> has this ethical um, behavior. But anyways, my point being here is that they are just publishing the way people normally publish, where they have a small line saying analysis were done in-house using software X, right? And this is really bad because then people are not able to see what the code was and how it worked and, and what it should look like and leads to these kinds of errors, right? So papers get retracted and then you say, okay, but if papers get retracted, that's a good thing because the system is self-correcting, right? But we know, and this is just an example from another publication uh, from Retraction Watch sh showing um, the papers, papers that were retracted, basically in blue, how many citations they had before the retraction and how many citations they got after the retraction, right? And it could be that all the citations after the retraction are basically saying, look, this paper is wrong because of this or it was retracted because of that and so on. But here, if you remember history correctly, um, you can see one very famous paper here, right? And we all know this one which is the famous uh, vaccines cause autism paper, right? So we need to improve the way we scrutinize analysis and the way we scrutinize what is being done in the papers, right? So just to make the point that even if papers do get retracted, they, still, they can still cause a lot, a lot of damage, right? Um, so here I would like then to open the case for open source, right? And how can we use open source to correct for all these things that I mentioned that are not very good uh, for science, right? So open source, very roughly speaking, is, is a way of producing knowledge where everything you're making can be code, can be hardware design, can be protocols, can even be cake recipes are created and shared freely via licenses, right? And there are dozens of them. 
and then you share them online or in whatever means you have at hand. So you can use USB sticks, a recipe notebook, whatever it is. And the point is that we've always done this, right? We've always shared things, we shared tapes, we shared, as I said, recipes, we shared software. We just have a fancy name for it now and metrics so that all the projects follow a certain standard, which is great, right? So to be considered open source, projects have to follow certain standards and then we know we're all speaking about the same language, about the same thing, right? If you don't, if you think that this is not something that is attainable, basically open source software is what powers your smartphones, your data centers, your computers, supercomputers, everything. So basically the world runs on open source software. There was um, here uh, in this article, it shows that 78% of the companies uh, run some sort of open source software. Less than 3% of the companies don't use any type of open source software, right? So basically this is used also um, in a much wider setting than only in academia. Um, here I would like then to show one example of a very good piece of open source software that basically is changing the way people are doing data analysis or has the potential to change the way people do data analysis and how they explain their code and everything. So here we're gonna, um, let me just open a screen here. Sorry, just a second to show you. Um, the one example of these Jupyter notebooks and how it looks like and why I think more people should be using I mean, there is already a lot of people using them, but why more people should be using them. So one thing is because um, Jupyter notebooks are language programming language agnostic or analysis language agnostic, right? So basically you can uh, use it to share code in Python, in R, in Ruby, whatever it is that you want. Um, and here I'm gonna show Here, so here, if you can see my screen, um, you can see this is from a paper we published in the lab not long ago, but basically what you have is this uh, nice interface where you can have a mix of explanation blocks and uh, text and code, right? So you can see here in the first part, you have what it is, then you have some code in Python, then you have a bunch of parameters, a bunch of code, then you can plot the figures already from your code, as you can see here. Uh, why you execute this and what I like the most is basically here for instance you have a very big chunk of explanation why we're using this code how we're using it what are the equations that led to the code that we're using and so on so basically this leads to a much better scrutiny of um, the code we're publishing and the things that we are um, promoting right and what is very nice is that you can combine this now with something called binder my binder which is basically you upload everything to the web, your Jupyter notebook, and Binder will take care of rendering this for the user on the web browser so they don't have even to install anything on their computer to be able to execute the code. So basically, <coughs> people can um, take a paper, read it, click on a link from my Binder, and execute the code that they're reading from the paper right away and actually change the variables in that code to see what, it hap what happens. Right, so, oh, if I change this variable, so if I don't use this speed or that speed for some physics measurement, what happens to the end result? Right, so this leads to a much better grasp and a much more interactive way of reading and understanding papers. Right, and because then uh, reviewers can also see the code, things like, oh, after the publication realized that our code was wrong, are less prone to happen. Right, so now... I would just like to show that there are many, many, and this is just a very small part of it, but these are all examples of open source software. And in this case, because I have a neuroscience background, they're all related, mostly related to neuroscience. But I think if you Google for open source, whatever piece of software you're looking for, you're gonna find very nice alternatives, right? And so this is just one example that this is not a very, you know, one very niche, small thing that a couple of people are doing, but rather, a lot of in academia is already running on proper open source software. So just a small wrap up. There are many, many tutorials online. You can always reach out to developers if you're trying to establish something in your lab. They will always be super happy to, happy, uh, 
sorry, they will always be super happy to help. Uh, you can always also find information on the Open Science book, of course. And here, shout out, shout out to uh, the OpenScapes project, which is, I think, very, very nice um, from um, Julia Lotus in, in the US, where she's creating a mentorship program to empower scientists to use open data science tools. Right, so they have a program where they teach in, in a couple of months people to use all these tools and actually um, do all of this data analysis thing online. It might be actually a good point to intersect with Open Science MOOC that I think about it to bring her content or bring some Open Science MOOC content to her work. Okay, so now we turn gears to actually hardware, right? Things we can touch and grasp. Um, and so is open better? And I would like to start with a little anecdote, right? This actually happened a month and a half ago in the lab. And what you're seeing here is a vacuum pump that it's basically just a pump that um, brings solution out of a chamber into this waste bottle that you're seeing there. Right, and the one we had in the lab, which is exactly this model, excuse me, um, broke, right? So we contacted the company to know how much it was to get a new one and how much time it would take us. Right, so here you can see the lead times. Of course, I'm not gonna say which company was this, but basically it takes in between eight to 10 weeks uh, to get this piece of tool and uh, it costs 710 pounds plus um, you know uh, shipping and, and whatever it is and so if you think that this is um, from our setups it basically means we would stop research from 8 to 10 weeks until this arrives which is of course really bad right but because I'm in the lab actually building tools I said let me take this thing and take a look at it and see what is this actually composed of Right, so what you can see here is that I just flipped this thing upside down. And I don't know if you can read inside this, this red box here. So I made it easier. I just wrote it myself what it says. And it's basically saying aquarium equipment. Right, so we're being sold a piece of aquarium pump with a nice casing, a nice bottle that's true for 750 bucks with posting plus eight to 10 weeks wait time. And then you say, but maybe aquarium pumps are expensive, right? And then we did the job of going on eBay and looking for a new one. And you can get a double outlet air pump uh, from eBay for $17.99. And you can get shipped in two days, right? So I basically told the company, look, I'm not going to buy this because I found a much better do-it-yourself solution. Thank you anyways. Um, but this is to show that we need to start being critical about the equipment we're using because I have a suspicion that like just like in open act or in, in publications and in editing companies, we are being taken for fools and being sold things that are way too expensive for what they cost. And these companies are making a huge profit margin. And what I didn't mention is that I only got this quotation and everything after three emails and two days of waiting, right? So this is really an obsolete, obese system, so to say, right? Um, but this is just an anecdote to get things kick-started and, and get us thinking about these things, right? If we don't even think about that, right, let's think about this, the, the instruments that we're actually using that are crucial for us every day in the lab, right? What you can see here are microscopes. So this one uh, on the left from the 1920s, if I'm not mistaken, and this one on the right, a little bit more modern, but you can see that in over more than 80 years, things didn't change much. They still have, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, they still have eyepiece, lenses, and a place to put your samples and something to move your sample, right? And these guys cost around 5,000 uh, euros. And this is just for the regular optical one, right? They were built first in the, six, in the 17th century. Uh, so there are no more patents for them. And they're a crucial piece for research and diagnostics, right? If you want to, in, this, in this model here to add fluorescence, you need to fork over another 5,000 uh, euros. So this, of course, shuts a lot of people out. Not to say the point that if you are outside Europe, US and Japan, uh, you have a very hard time getting those. First, because they get stuck in customs, they are hard to ship, they're big, they're bulky. And once they break, you have no local support uh, to repair them. And they're also built with um, these markets in mind, right? So Europe, US and Japan, which have power source constantly, uh, certain room temperature and all these things. Right? As an oppose, opposing point, we have open source uh, microscopes. And what you can see here are different models. And basically, each of these models have different capabilities, 
they're all published in peer-reviewed journals, so basically you can know exactly what they're capable of and, and what are their shortcomings. They're much more affordable, so the most expensive model is this one here um, in the middle, which costs, I think, a thousand uh, pounds to build. But this one on the left, I think, is in the range of 50. This one here is in the range of 100. And this one is also around 50 to 100 bucks, right? They're all small, so they mostly feed on the palm of your, on your palm. They're portable. You can drive them with batteries, and they're easy to customize because all of their building plans are online. So you can see exactly how they're built. You can see which kind of tools you need to build them. And um, you can actually change them for the needs you have, right? So in this way, they're much more... Um, easy to use in, in very different settings, right? Um, there are other examples. So, for instance, for molecular biologists, this came out last year. It's basically a 3D printed mic micro pipette that meets the ISO standard for accuracy. So this is as accurate and as uh, precise as um, commercially available ones. And because you can build these yourself for a couple of bucks, you can also calibrate them much more often. You can know when they're gone wrong. You can use them anywhere. And you know all of these advantages of open source software also apply to open source hardware, especially in academia. Right? This is another example for people in plant physiology. Basically, um, it's a really small portable lighting system for, for small plants that are growing that changes a little bit from this traditional system where you have one light for all of these plants. And in the paper they show here, you can see in the bottom, that the plants are not evenly illuminated, right? So this increases um, the variability in your results because your lighting system for the plants is not uniform, right? So plants in the middle um, are getting more light than plants in the border, which is not the case for what this thing that they created, which is a small box where you just put your, your plants in um, and you have LEDs that are controllable and you can have diff in the same space you can have much more plants with different lightings and different uh, growing conditions so you can actually speed up research by parallelizing for instance the kind of plant growth you have right and this is also applicable to other areas and other fields um, here's one example that I like quite a lot if you have a moment go take a look at this at safecast.org this is a device here you can see on the left um, it's a Geiger counter, right? But it's a modern version of a Geiger counter that is basically connected to the web and sends data automatically to a database and it's portable and driven by batteries. So these guys created this device. It's completely open source after the Fukushima uh, disaster, right? And what they did is they made a partnership with um, the government in Japan. And from what I remember and understand, they had this in all posts, cars, trucks, Right, so they basically made this map that you're seeing here in the middle um, with um, data points for radiation. And what you can see here in the top is basically the map they made for uh, where the government was planning to evacuate people, if I'm not mistaken, this green, little green area. And they saw that um, they had to isolate a much bigger area because all of this red spot here is uh, are places which are having radiation, right? And what you can see here, and I think this is from, I, I think my screen here is on top. I don't remember from which date it is, but ever since they launched, you can see how many data points they collected on radiation all over the globe and here. And this is from a good three, four years ago. Um, they had more than 40 million data points for radiation all over the world. They're actually now starting for a couple of, I think a year old now, uh, the same system, but for air pollution. So thank you, uh, Paul is writing that it's March 2011, the map here. Um, so a couple of years old now. And they're doing the same now for air pollution. So this would be very interesting to have a very complete map of air pollution all over the world. And it's a community driven project. So it's fantastic. It also changes the way we think about data collection and what we can do uh, in terms of environmental science using open source tools. Here, as for software, are more examples of open source hardware. These are just a few, but there are many, many different things. So, for instance, you can build with Raspberry Pi computers that are um, these $20 credit card size computers. You can build computing clusters 
Of course, you're not going to use this to make really deep calculations, but you can teach students all about parallel computing using one of these for a couple of thousand dollars and not overload um, cluster time, right? The other thing is that um, here you have, and this I like a lot, is a 3D printed stethoscope that a publication came out showing that for five bucks you can 3D print one of those. And actually it's in the same quality as uh, the leading in the market ones that are sold for 300. And what is more important is that the group that developed this is actually building them uh, in the Gaza Strip, right? Because they don't get access to these tools there. So they had to bring in parts for 3D printers. And now there are 3D printing stethoscopes there to offer to improve care for patients or people in the Gaza Strip. Right, another example is an atomic force microscope, which is quite nice. And then you have things like robots to automate things in the lab. So this is basically a robot to dispense um, food for fruit flies, flies. And so you can um, basically save people a lot of time by automating a lot of things in the lab, right? And this is super, it's open source, so you can build it yourself and replicate it and, and you know, implement this in your lab. Uh, there are several examples, but these are just some. Just an illustration, again, that this is actually something that is happening right now. It's not something that, you know, just a very niche thing that people are just doing in secret. Um, there are companies providing service around this. These are a couple of them. And again, because I'm coming from a neuroscience space, I know more things that are neuroscience related. Um, I would recommend if you have a moment, go look at all of these. They have quite interesting things. So some of them have computer, brain-computer interfaces. This is from uh, OpenROV, is for um, um, underwater drone, not drone, an underwater unmanned vehicle, right, for also studies in environmental sciences. OpenIFIS is doing electrophysiology for neuroscience as an open system. Um, I don't have here, but a shout out to OpenTrons which is a company developing pipetting robots and they're open source and they cost in the range, I think, of $4,000. Uh, and what I like about them is that people say you should not do open source because it's not profitable, not rentable. Um, and they just raise money from venture capital. So basically with an open source model where all the products are open source, you can still have a company that is profitable and is still able to provide good quality uh, tools for science, right? And all of these are also doing that. So just keep in mind that this is not something that it's, you have to do it yourself. You can also buy from companies and there are more and more companies coming about uh, to provide services with this, okay? Um, so just a brief uh, overview of this. So basically um, open science hardware, I think we're living the Cambrian explosion um, on open science hardware. If you go into Wikipedia and type open, open source hardware, you're going to find more than 70 projects, but they're all, let's say, big and, and commercial level projects. In these slides, I cited more than 36. Um, there are many, many, many repositories online. So what I always like to do before starting developing something is to Google for open source and then the tool that I'm trying to develop to see what other people didn't start um, doing this and, and start developing, co-developing with them or picking up where they left off, right? And the other reason for so many tools being there is that um, the tools to create hardware are getting better and easier. So you have 2D printers that are getting better. You have software that is getting better to create uh, these tools. Um, the software to do electronics is getting better, all of these things. You can get printed circuit boards that are the brains that are living inside all of these pieces of hardware, very cheap, uh, delivered to you in a week. Uh, the internet infrastructure is really allowing us to upload videos and tutorials and things that allow people to learn. And all of these companies that are popping up uh, with open source business models are now a little bit older than five years old, um, which tends to show that this is a way that it will work. It's just a matter of time, I hope that everybody is able then to buy a piece of science hardware that it's open source. Um, and then a little bit of a comparison. Traditional systems, as we said, in research, they're expensive. They are one supplier commitment. So basically, if you buy a microscope from Zeiss or from Leica or from Nikon, 
you won't be able to get parts or, or replacement parts from other companies. You have to always be stuck with one of those. And if you paid 5,000 euros for one piece of hardware, you're not going to want people tinkering with it and customizing and upgrading and so on. Again, because they're expensive, you're only going to have one per lab or one per classroom. Um, they have costly calibrations. You have to call the company. If there is a bug, if there is a problem, it's hard to spot because it's a black box. And there is a fixed one size has to fit all model, right? So you have to buy that. And if you have a situation where, let's say, you don't have a very reliable power supply, you're stuck with that and then you have to figure out a way around it, right? On the other hand, open source systems are way more affordable or they can be because you know exactly what kind of parts they are built with and how much time it takes to build them. So you can know what people are selling you. Uh, you can buy the parts from anywhere, right? So AliExpress nowadays deliver everywhere in the world. You can know the tool from inside out, so you know exactly what you input and what the tool can give you out. So if you get weird results from a certain experiment, then uh, you can know earlier if it, become, it comes from your, your system or if it's actually something that you're properly measuring, right? And then because they're so cheap, you can have many per lab or per classroom. So people can learn with more hands-on approach than just theory. In principle, you can calibrate all of these before every experiment. So your devices are really optimally working all the time. Bugs are easier to spot because they're open source and you can adapt them to your local realities, right? So if you don't have a certain part, but you know what that part is doing, you can substitute that for something else and try to see if it works the same way, right? So here, just a shout out for these projects that I'm running with Mozilla and the Fellows Freie Wissen program, which um, it came to attend this one problem of open source hardware, which I think is the project normally starts with a local need, right? So it's one lab in one department and inside one institution that wants to develop one tool, right? But this is not necessarily serving the community the best way. Um, so basically, the question is, can we ask the community what they need and um, build the tools based on that. So if you go onto this repository here, you're gonna see we're already on phase two and we're always looking for more collaborators. And phase two means we use the results from the survey we did to build tools. So people are actually building tools based on a demand from researchers around the world. And here, a special shout out to all the contributors of this project. There are people in Argentina, in Africa, in Europe, in the US. Um, in the UK, uh, in the Netherlands, in Germany, and they're all contributing to this, and in Canada, and none of this would be possible without them, and without the people who reply to the survey, and we always would like more and more people, so please, by all means, visit uh, the landing page and the repository, and, and or give, send me a message so that we can find ways to collaborate. We would always love to have more and more people uh, building tools together with us. Uh, one more shout out, which is the GOSH community, which is the Gathering for Open Science Hardware, where these people came together. It's a network of networks uh, that wants to make open source hardware the norm for science by 2025, right? It's a very ambitious goal, but we have a very nice roadmap and a set of uh, tasks that we're actually doing also in a collaborative way. So we're always welcoming more people. So if you look for a GOSH community forum, you're going to see a very lively forum, very diverse, again, from people from all over the world. And there will be a meeting now in the Great Lakes uh, for this year, and I think they're preparing another one for next year already. So please do get involved. It would be wonderful to get more researchers involved in this. And especially, I think, if you're not building open science hardware, we would very much like the opinions of people who are hardcore users, right? Because in the end, the tools that we develop need to be tailored for the users. So we want your input on these things that we're developing. Uh, here is just a list of uh, repositories and online communities where you can find more open source hardware and places to look. Um, so this is, with, as with the slides are available, this will be available with them. And we can now open for questions and I would like to say thank you for your attention. <laughs>